will come face to face with science that has been invented by mostly by people uh, in schools and colleges and universities in Pakistan. So that's uh, one of his main efforts to popularize science, not only in, in, in universities but also for general public. So I would like to thank Dr. Sabi for taking uh, his time on uh, for this lecture. So let's welcome him. Uh, to everyone. Thank you, Pariyad, for the very generous introduction. In fact, it's a real honor for me today to be speaking the same workshop in which Professor Abdi is the lead, is the keynote speaker. I've always admired Professor Abdi for his teaching skills, for his care for detail. Uh, just look at his black. We saw his blackboard this morning. Look at his organization. Look at his writing. Look at his figures. Look at his phraseology, how he phrases his sentences. You don't need to do that in English because if you're teaching in school, it's always good to be bilingual. But look at the care and the devotion and the commitment to detail that exudes from his teaching. So I've always looked up to Professor Abdi, and I'm sure you had a similar experience this morning. So what I'm going to do in this hour or so is to actually uh, talk about one of the, or act rather, in, instead of talking, I do some acting here because I'm going to perform certain experiments. I'm going to highlight the importance of experiments. Professor Abdi talked about three pillars. One could argue that there are many more pillars, many more aspects to modern science, but he talked about three basic pillars. One is a hypothesis or a conjecture. You come up with an idea. That idea is many a times fueled by imagination, by creativity, by curiosity. There are leaps of faith in the unknown realm that one has to make to come up with an idea. Once you have an idea, you mathematicize it. Mathematicization means you couch it in a mathematical language, in some, in some symbolism, in some abstract no notions. You try to explain that phenomenon. That mathematical uh, acrobatics can actually give you new insights. So you build a mathematical model. But the third cornerstone of the scientific process is experiment. And as you all know, science and physics in particular is an experimental science. Unlike many other aspects of philosophy, it's not natural philosophy any longer. It's purely, it's an experimental science. So unless you use experiments and demonstrations inside the classroom or inside the laboratory, most of these ideas would be locked inside textbooks. You see, our students in schools and colleges, they observe, they make observations. The, the next step is to make quantitative observations. What differentiates a physicist from a layperson, by the way, I'm not treating physics as, a, as an elite subject, but what differentiates a scientist from the laity, from someone who just has a, has a pedestrian knowledge of science, is being quantitative. And once you, at once, so you need quantitative data. Now, how do you get that quantitative data? You need some kind of measurement tool. You need some kind of sensor that can actually look at a phenomenon. And once you have the quantitative data at your disposal, you can manipulate it. You can. Look at patterns, you can look at order, you can look at the underlying mathematical underpinnings of that data. And this is how you make the transformation or the metamorphosis from a layman to a scientist or a physicist. So the key aspect of scientific literacy in this country, and you are tasked with uh, stirring this revolution of scientific literacy as school teachers and college teachers, is to is you would like to enable yourself and your students to obtain quantitative data in a real experiment that is done in a classroom or a laboratory. And today I'm going to give you certain examples of how we could do that. And, and mind you, it's, it's not expensive. You, with very simple tools which are generally available in our houses, in our laboratories, uh, we all carry a tool that we call the smartphone. With, with the smartphone, I'll give you a demonstration, you can actually do a lot of experiments. 
And I would like to give you some examples of that. <clears throat> All right, so, so it's going to be a presentation, it's going to be a mixture of a presentation and a practical demonstration. So I would like to talk about video tracking and give you glimpses of how you could use a camera to look at the rotational motion that Professor Avi was mentioning in, in the earlier lecture. Can you just try to assume the rest of T. So, in our laboratories, in our pockets, in fact, we have this smartphone, which is a camera, and you can make an observation using a camera. You just need to have certain aspects of lighting covered up, uh, certain aspects of illumination that need to be looked after. But then you have phenomenon, and a camera is recording that phenomenon. And then you have some software, and there are many free softwares that are available, and I've also uh, built a software with the help of my team, with the help of which you can explore the kinematics. It could be translational kinematics, it could be rotational kinematics. So let me give you an example for that. And I'll start with a, with a more sophisticated example that probably you might not be able to do inside the classroom, inside the school. But it's nice to start off with a sophisticated example. All right, so I would invite you to look at a video that's going to show up here. So here what we have is a cone. So there's a cone here. So this is a cone, a metallic cone. Inside the cone, there is liquid nitrogen. And you will observe that at the apex of the cone, certain drops are being formed. Now these drops are actually liquid oxygen drops. So this atmosphere has 20% oxygen. When you cool the inside of the cone, it's at minus 196 degrees centigrade, which is the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. The outer surface of this cone is slightly warmer, but it's lower than the boiling point of liquid of oxygen. So the oxygen in the air condenses, and all the oxygen drops coalesce at the tip of this cone, and they fall down in the form of, an, of liquid oxygen drop. So you can actually make liquid oxygen from air using liquid nitrogen, which is easily available. Now this drop falls onto a rail, and this rail is like an inclined plane. The drop falls down the inclined plane and goes onto a flat surface. Let's see how it appears. So, so you can see the drops falling down, right? Now these drops go onto a plexiglass black surface. And if you observe carefully, these drops are, are being curved. These drops are changing the trajectory. They are deflecting back. So what we really have is a magnet is placed at the bottom of this plexiglass sheet. And you know from basic school level chemistry and physics that liquid oxygen is paramagnetic. It is steered by magnetic fields. It, is affected by magnetic fields. It is pulled into magnetic fields. So this liquid oxygen drop is actually changing. It's being deflected by the action of a magnetic field. Now you take a video of this entire phenomenon and put it into your software that actually tracks these drops, looks at the trajectory of these drops, and these are the kind. This is the kind of quantitative data that you can obtain just with the help of a camera observing a natural phenomenon. Let me give you some more examples, just to, just for motivational purposes. All right, so take a string and make it taut, put a mass on its other end that goes over a pulley and take a camera and just place the the camera in front of the string. Vibrate the string with the help of a speaker that is commonly available. 
you can use two cameras as well. Now track the motion of the string as you change the frequency of this oscillation. Now this is something that is can readily be built up inside a laboratory or inside a classroom and then a new world of quantitative data opens in front of you. So when we perform this experiment, this is the kind of data that we get. If we have a certain frequency, the string oscillates. So on this axis is the horizontal displacement of the string, and on the vertical axis is the vertical displacement of the string. And you will observe that this string is not making a strictly vertical motion, it's actually going in an oblique direction. You increase the frequency of oscillation, this oscillation becomes larger. At a certain point, the string starts going into an elliptical mode. The linear polarization tends to go into an elliptical polarization, so the string is actually making an elliptical trajectory now. And this ellipse grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Bigger. At a certain frequency that we call the resonant frequency that depends upon the length of the string and the tension inside the string, which is the mass that is suspended from the end, this ellipse grows into an almost circuit. This is called resonance. Now, everyone observes a vibrating string, but just with the help of a camera, you can actually get quantitative data. And this data, you can expose this data to students. They can, they can work on the mathematics. They can understand this phenomenon. And it can lighten up your teaching. You could look at all kinds of non-linear phenomenon as well. Something really interesting happens when actually you excite this string at subharmonics. So if the string has a resonance frequency of say 100 hertz, and you excite it at 50 hertz, or at 25 hertz, or at 12.5 hertz, which are subharmonics of the fundamental frequency, you get this extremely beautiful, these sophisticated, these eye-bewildering patterns which exactly match or roughly match uh, the theoretical predictions. Just like the petals of a flower. These are called Rodonia petals. Now the key point that I would like to make is that just with the help of a sensor such as a camera, you can actually lighten up, illuminate and scintillate and fascinate your students. And this is something that you should all try in your classrooms and in your laboratories. Take a string, a spring for example, attach a mask to it and put a camera in front of it. And you can observe oscillations. You can make this oscillator uh, vibrate inside a liquid of some viscosity. You can change the viscosity of the liquid. You can use sugar, you can use a sugar solution, you can use honey, glycerin, normal water, tap water and look at the damping of these oscillations. So all of this data has been acquired by a camera. This is something you find in textbooks, but you really need to make physics come out of the textbook. It's not a prisoner of the textbook that's locked inside the textbook. It has to come to life. And unless you spark the imagination of your students with these simple experiments, unfortunately, our younger generation is would like to have entertainment all the time. They, they would like to they are easily bored out of, to death out of textbook knowledge, so they really have to be excited about science and physics in particular. So it's really important that you have access to, to these tools and you can use, for example, the camera to enliven your teaching. So some of the experiments that we do in our laboratory, which could also be done in, in a classroom, for example, or inside a school laboratory, here you have a carom board and you have two pucks and these pucks are colliding with one another and you have a camera placed on top of this carom board and you can observe the motion of these pucks. Now these pucks actually show very complicated motion and I'm going to demonstrate this in a minute. They show rotational motion, they show translational motion, you would like to see if momentum is conserved, energy is conserved. Here in front of you there's an inclined plane. We could roll down an object along this inclined plane and actually use a camera to track its motion. So now let me give you some concrete examples of how this could be done. Uh, and I'll use this example of a carom board. And I would like to use the example of two objects colliding on a carom board. And I would like to track the motion of these two objects. So a real example in front of you. I already have taken a video and I would like you to go through this 
exercise with me. It's it's going to be interesting, hopefully. All right. So let me first show you what the video looks like. You can always ask questions. All right. So what we have here is opening up a video. Uh, excuse me. Just I need to change the screen settings. Just hold on, please. striker you don't you could also strike this striker with the help of your hand with the flick of a finger so this is a striker puck this is a struck puck this striker hits the struck puck and if you observe on these pucks we have these two additional marks so let's see what the video looks like all right now this is a simple phenomenon our students observe such phenomenon on a daily basis. They always make collisions. Now, can we use physics? Can we use a camera to gather green quantitative data so that students can make sense of what they learn in their classroom? The equations that they learn, they have to come to life. All right, let's look at another video. And this is the video that I'm going to process. Now, if you observe the motion of these pucks, the motion is actually quite complicated. Not only do these pucks show translational motion, they are also showing rotational motion. So there's a combination of rotational motion and translational motion. And in Professor Abdi's next lecture, he's going to highlight the independence of rotational and translational motion. So certain quantities are conserved if you have pure rotational motion and certain quantities are conserved if you have pure rotational motion. And both of them are independent. So now let's analyze this video. Let's try to convert this video from an observation which is now being supported by a camera into quantitative data. All right. So for that, we've actually written a software that is, and this computer codes are freely available. You can use them. The only thing is that you need to have some basic knowledge, working knowledge of a software such as MATLAB. But that's not necessary at the moment. That's besides the point. I'm just going to show you that all of this could be done. So what I do is I've written a code that analyzes 2D collisions. Let me just try to increase the font size here a little bit. Is this better? No? Okay, let me increase it further. Slightly better? Yes? Okay. So first of all, I'm going to clear all the data that's already here in my workspace. Okay. I write the name of my computer program, which is Analyze 2D Collision. All right, I run it. Now the uh, code is asking me for the video, the input. Now your student can actually make the video using his, smart, his or her smartphone camera or a DSLR or any camera that is available, a webcam, and store that video inside the computer and then use some software, example is being provided, that can actually extract the trajectories 
the motion, the kinematics, how is an object rotating, how is an object translating in real time with the help of the software. All right, so I open up a, a video, I go to collisions, and this is the kind of video that I would like to open, that I would like to analyze. The first thing that the software asks is, you need time information. So your camera is actually acquiring frames at a certain frame rate. So all trajectories, all kinematics are with respect to time. So you would like to plot how does the distance change with time? How does an angle change with time? So you need to provide it with timing information. So what the camera does, it makes a video. And that video is actually a composition of frames that are acquired at supposedly equal intervals of time. So you need to tell the software the frame rate. What's the time interval between two consecutive frames? The, fa the camera that we are using does 240 frames in one second. So we provide it with this information. All right. So far, so good. And a screenshot of the video opens up. Now you can preview this vi video in this software. So you can see it in slow motion. Now what we are playing are successive frames inside the video. So this is a preview. And what we would like to tell the software, okay, where do you start your analysis and where do you end your analysis? And what are the objects that you would like to track? Of course we would like to track the two paths and we would also like to track the two markers on each puck. And why would we like to track the markers? Because the, this puck is showing rotational motion as well. So we would like to have all this information in front of us. So we tell this software, okay, we would like to start it off at a certain point. Let's see where we would like to start. Okay, this is the point where we would like to start our analysis. This is object A striking onto object B. All right, so let's start our analysis at this frame. I halt the video at this frame and I tell my software that this is my mark in frame. This is where I would like to begin my analysis. Okay. This is my starting frame. Now where do I where would I like to go up to? I just see what's a useful region of my video where I would like to stop my analysis. Okay, I would like to see all of this. I would like to track this rotation, this translation, and here I would like to stop here. Okay, so I mark the frame where I would like to stop the analysis. I call it the mark out frame. So now this is not observable here and I can't change the font size here. I have started at frame number 47. This is a small value here. And I end my analysis at frame number 138. So I have about 92 frames inside my video and I know the time interval between these frames and I would like to analyze this motion. All right, so I go to the next step. All right. Now, as you know, physics does not care about the reference frame. Physics, as you know, is homogeneous. If I define this particular point to be my origin, and I'm moving in a certain way, and you're observing me, so you're making an observation, another friend who's sitting at another location is also making an observation, it's the same physical event. The physical laws don't change upon where you observe. What's your observation point? However, this gentleman here would measure some displacement for me, would measure some velocity for me, and another lady sitting on the other corner would me measure some other parameters for me. That's why I need a reference frame. I need to define my displacements, my distances, my velocity. <coughs> so I need to define a reference frame for that. And the software allows you to define a reference frame. That's the next step in the analysis. You need to find out what is your trajectory, what are your x values, what are your y values. For that, you need to define an origin, and you need to define what's the direction of increasing x, what's the direction of increasing y. What is your reference point for your angles in angular displacement? You could choose the horizontal axis, you could choose the vertical axis, any axis that your little heart desires. So we have to define a reference frame, and that's what we're going to do next. We define a reference coordinate system. All right, so now you can see these two arrows, these two lines here. This is my x-axis and this is my y-axis. 
and my origin is here. So I think this is a pretty good choice, but let me just change the origin. I use this point as the origin, and I would like to use this axis, this particular axis as the x-axis, but I would just like to have it horizontal for my heart's desire, no special reason. I would like to make things simple and orderly. We are three-dimensional human beings. We would like x to be along the horizontal, so I would like to change my x-axis to the horizontal line, it automatically adjusts the y-axis. So this is my x-axis, this is my y-axis. Now as time progresses inside this video, the software is going to capture the coordinates of this, of this motion, of this kind of matrix. And it's going to capture the rotational motion as well as the translational motion. Alright, now the key point is you could do it yourself. I don't want to overawe you or inspire you. What I want you to do is that I'm just like you. My students do it all the time. You can do it inside your classroom as well. And it's not difficult. So try to get your hands on, on some experimental techniques that can scintillate your students. All right, you define the reference frame. Uh, let's set up a unit. So the camera doesn't know what is a millimeter, what is a centimeter, what's, what's a meter. It only knows about pixels. So you would like to tell the camera, okay, this particular size is given by 5 millimeters or 10 millimeters. So you would like to convert the pixels into absolute units and you could do it here. It's not important, it just descales everything. So I just put in some calibration factor here in the unit, in, the, in this box here. So I close this. Now what do I want to track? In each pulp. I would like to track the puck itself. Now what defines the puck? The puck, is a, the puck here is an extended object. It's a rigid extended object. I would like to choose a point on the puck that defines the puck. I could define the centroid or the center of mass of the puck. Yeah. And I also, but that would not tell me the internal degrees of freedom. That would not tell me if this puck is actually rotating. In order to look at the rotational motion of this puck, I would like to identify these two points that are not on the center, that are marked on the periphery of this puck. So I would like to define these two points on each puck and I would like to define the centroid of the puck. Because now I have translational motion and rotational motion, both of them are hand in glove with one another. Alright? So I would like to mark my objects. So I click manually mark an object and I take the cursor here, the cross here and mark this object and here you will observe the centroid, the geometrical center of this marked region is going to appear, the x, y coordinates will appear here, unfortunately you can't see the font is too small but nevertheless, then I would like to mark the second object, so I mark it again. Okay, I mark the second object, then I mark the third object, then I mark the fourth object. Alright, so now I have identified the objects that I would like to track. The only thing that remains is I would like to identify the puck itself. I haven't done that at, at the moment, but I have only identified two points, two peripheral points on each but, all right, I go to the next step. Now this software is calculating the trajectory of these objects. Now you see a cluster of points on each marked object. So this is a red cluster, a green cluster, a blue and a black cluster. This, so what the software is doing is actually tracking these marked points in each successive frame. So that I can build up a trajectory over time. Alright. Now the software is asking me, do you want to filter out some points? Because uh, after all, it's a human written software. It's, some of these points will fall off from the marked objects. I would like to keep only the points that I'm interested in. Some of these objects are going to meander in different directions. They're going to fall off. So I would just like to 
filter out the points that I really need. So I go to the next step and I run this and I carefully observe if some of the points are actually losing out from the marked object. Here I observe, now it's not really visible on this uh, magnification, but I observe some points that have lost the marked object. So I want to remove those points from my analysis. But this is a technical detail, it's not very important to understand at the, at the minute. Alright, so here is my trajectory. There's another point that I would like to remove. Some points I would like to remove here. All right, so we have marked the objects of interest and each object has with it a cluster of points tagged along with that object. Some of those points stick to our desired object, some of those points just fall off because it's an edge detection algorithm inspired from image processing. So I'm going to remove those points. This is just a technical detail, so don't worry about it. Then I go to the next step. And now I would like to track <coughs> the overall object. And for that purpose, this software allows us to draw a circle around the puck. And then it computes the centroid of that circle, which gives the center of mass motion of each puck. So I draw a circle around each point, around each puck. And the circle requires three points. So I just identify three points. I don't want to continue with this circle because I made a wrong choice. Let me do it more carefully. One point, two point, three point. So this is a circle now that captures the entire object. And the software calculates the centroid of this circle, which is in effect looking at the center of mass of this puck. All right, I would like to continue with the circle, yes. And then need to identify the second object now. Three points make a circle. One, two, three. I have my second circle. Now the software runs its engine. Lots of calculation on the background. It's busy and it generates the plots. It generates the trajectory. So let's look at the output. This is the basic trajectory of this system. What's happening over here? This red shows the original object. All right, the original object comes in. The blue shows the struck object, object number B. This object comes in, strikes, Object B, A deflects, and B deflects. It initiates some motion. And in this graph, we're only looking at the center of mass motion of the two parts. Now, what you could do is you could see if this satisfies the conservation of momentum principle. You would need to know what these angles are. And you need to know what these velocities are. So. Now, the spacing between these part, these markers actually gives us an indication of the velocities. You can find out the spacing between these markers and compute the velocities as well. You can compute the momentums. You can see if momentum is being conserved. In the next graph, which is graph number two, this is a more vivid demonstration of how this object is showing rotation and translation at the same time. So look at this object. There are two peripheral points marked on this object and this trajectory, this lower trajectory, it's greenish or yellowish, shows one of these markers and the bluish trajectory shows the other marker. Look at this trajectory. 
these trajectories are cycloidal, which actually show that these, this disc is rotating and translating at the same time. Likewise, after collusion, puck number A is also showing rotational motion alongside translational motion. Now, with the help of a camera and with the help of a computer software, you can actually look at these motions in detail. And the next thing that you could do is you could compute the velocities. Once you have the data at your disposal, you can always differentiate the data, find out the spacing between two consecutive points divided by the time lapse, you will get the velocities. You could do another differentiation, you can find out the accelerations. You can compute momentums. You could see whether conservation of momentum holds true. And in fact, the software allows you to compute all the angles as well. Unfortunately, it's not showing up uh, on the projector screen, but here there are certain angles that are visible. So I can tell from reading on my computer screen that a certain angle, uh, this angle is about 56 degrees, and another angle, which is the angle at which uh, object B is deflected is about 25 degrees. So you can actually compute angles and the velocities. Here you can see the velocities as well, which are not visible at the moment, but I can tell you from the screen what these velocities are. So with the help of a software, you can actually observe motion and go beyond mere observation. You can quantitatively observe motion. You can make quantitative estimates of whether momentum is being conserved, what are the velocities, how are the velocities changing, how are the angles changing, and so on. Any questions up to this point? Yes? Uh, sir, I wanted to ask, are you using the uh, video in the same frame that it was recorded or you changed the frame before putting it into MATLAB? So it's an MP, MP4 format or QuickTime video or an MPG video and it's but for it's more... it's slower motion recording. No, we, we can run this at any desired frame rate that we, once it's inside the computer, we can play it out at any frame rate, but it's a standard video format, nothing particular about it. And there are free softwares available. If you're not comfortable with MATLAB, you can download another software, which is called Tracker, which is freely available. Well, if you let me move back to my uh, presentation. So with a pendulum you can observe, with a spring you can observe what the displacement is with time, you can look at oscillatory motion, you can differentiate this data to look at velocities uh, and you can find all kinds of quantitative stuff. Now another example that is actually quite illuminating and this is uh, an experiment that our students do inside the classroom or inside the laboratory rather. We have an inclined plane over here. And we're going to move to the blackboard as well to understand this phenomenon better. And here we have a disk, which is hollow from the inside. So it's a hollow metallic disk. And at the top, we put a, put glued a piece of paper. And we have two objects here, two markers here, that can be used to track the rotation of this object. And we just slide this down on an inclined plane. We can change the height of the inclined plane as well. <laughs> this object just slides down. So we need some kind of camera to track this motion. So let's move to the blackboard to understand this better and see if we can actually relate some of this observation with, with what we learn in a formal classroom environment. By the way, this simple device can also be used to illustrate static friction, as you know, right? How would you do that? So this is an object. So I, if I were to increase the inclination, at some point this object would actually start to slip down.
Okay? So, which means that now if this inclination is going up, the downward force on, on this uh, object is also increasing in proportion to sine theta, where theta is the angle of inclination. But still it's not sliding down. If I increase theta, the object might still be at rest. Which means that there is an upward force acting on this, on this object. And that upward force is nothing but friction. And that friction is dynamic. It's not kinetic friction, it's static friction because this object is at static, but it dynamically adapts itself. It grows with the change of the angle. That's why friction is quite problematical and it's quite subtle to understand. The static friction is not a constant value, it actually adapts itself in accordance with the situation. Now, let's look at this problem from a purely mechanics perspective and see what's going on. Now, here is our inclined plane. <laughs> and on this inclined plane, we have a spherical object. which is prone to downward motion. This object may have some mass m. All right, so what we would like to do is, there are two kinds of motion that are taking place in this particular example. One is translation. So if I just look at the center of mass of this object, which is say, p, and I focus on nothing else but the center of mass of this object, then of course this object is coming down. It's sliding down. So this is pure translational motion if you just look at the center of mass. However, as this object falls down, it continues its descent towards the ground. It's also rolling. It's also undergoing rolling motion. So there has to be some angular velocity associated with this. All right. So now we have two kinds of motion here. Now we would like to analyze this motion. Now we have translation and rotation at the same time. In order to look at problems of this kind, there are multiple approaches. The simplest approach is to look at what are the forces acting on this object and what are the torques that are acting on this object. You, you, you learn about torques probably in Professor Abhi's next lecture, but let, let's look at the forces that are acting on this object. So this is a snapshot of this roller at an instant of time. I have frozen time, and when I freeze time, this is the picture that I get. And I would like, at this instant, I would like to find out what are the forces acting on this rolling object. So, all right. Now, what's the first force that immediately comes to your mind? It's gravity. Gravity acts on anything that has mass. So, this gravity acts downwards, ng. All right. Now, anything else? Friction. And a normal force. Okay. So now, vectors are important that Professor Abdi has mentioned. So this force can actually be resolved into two components. It can be broken down into two components. And we could break down the, these components into any direction. But whatsoever we like. But according to the symmetry of this problem, we would like to break down this force into two components. One is normal to the inclined plane and one is along the inclined plane. So this angle is theta. This angle by the similarity of triangle would also be theta. And this component would therefore be mg Sin, uh, sorry, cosine theta 
and this component would be mg sin theta. So this is just one force which has now been resolved or decomposed into two components. We could resolve this force into any direction that we like. But I've chosen it to resolve it in these two directions for some special reasons. Now, if you look at this instant of motion, there's a point of contact between the object, the rolling cylinder, and the inclined plane. Now, whenever you talk about rotation, I have rotation here. What is meant by rotation? By rotation, I mean, or anyone means, that there is a certain line that you can draw about which, which is at rest. All points on that line will be at rest. This is what rotation means. Okay? In translate, if I am translating, my center of mass is moving, and so are all points that are in my body, because I am a rigid body. However, in rotation, I can always identify a group of points or one point about which is at rest in a particular frame of reference. And that group of points is actually generally called a point of rotation or an axis of rotation or a plane of rotation. Here, if you look at this two-dimensional problem, you weighing it from the top, there's a single point that is at rest. And rotation is taking place about that axis of rotation. So we've looked at the translational motion. This object is sliding down. Now we're going to put rotational motion into the picture. So we look at this. Now I could draw another blown up view of this rolling cylinder. And here is the inclined plane. This inclined plane at this instant of time, which is frozen in time, makes contact with only one point, ideally, you know, not really, but just assume it makes an atomic contact with this cylinder. This is the point which is which qualifies as the axis of rotation. Because this point is going to be static at that instant of time. <coughs> now when the movie plays, this ball is going to fall down. So the <coughs> axis is going to change dynamically, but at that instant, this is the axis of rotation. Now this object is going to fall, is going to slide down or roll down. Now what keeps this point static? Because this point is also, there has to be a force in the upward direction that keeps this point static. Because all of these points are tend to move downwards. So there has to be a force which is along the inclined plane and in the upward direction. That is what qualifies as the force of friction. Okay, so we have identified two forces. One is the weight of the object which acts on the body. The second is the force, the frictional force which actually keeps this point static. Otherwise, this point is going to skid downwards. You will have skidding motion. In order to have pure rolling motion, there has to be a point that is static and that is, can only be possible when there is an upward force which prevents this object from skidding down and that upward force is dynamically built up by the force of friction. And if I have pure rolling motion, this force of friction will adapt itself to keep this point static. Now you also observe, okay, when, when you make an observation in real life, this object is as accelerating along the slanting height of this inclined plane, but it's not moving vertically, it's not moving normally to the plane. Alright, so this is an observation. You observe this. Now you have to come up with some argument that explains why this object is not accelerating normally to the plane. Because this component of the force is problematical. This component of the force is normal to the plane and it's in the downward direction. And if you just have this force, let it play its 
play its role, this object should accelerate downwards. But there's no acceleration normal to the plane, which means that in a direction normal to the plane, a new force has to be invented, which is actually there, which accounts for cancelling this component of the weight. And that is called the normal force, generally called the normal force. Complicated origins, but it exists. And all of these are vectors. So this is a vector. So is this. This is also a vector. So now we've constructed a free body diagram in which we have three forces. A weight, a force of friction, and a normal force. Now with the help of, of, the, of this free body diagram, we can analyze the entire motion of, of this object rolling down an inclined plane. But let's talk about what causes the rotation. Now rotation is caused, my first question is, this angular velocity, omega, as this object rolls down, Will omega be constant? Yes. I'm talking about magnitude. Is it going to be constant? It's not going to be constant here. Okay, it's going to change. A simple way to look at this is, is the speed, the linear speed going to change as this object goes down? Yes. All right. And we've learned that V equals omega R. So if this speed is going up, so omega, the angular velocity of this object should also change. It should also go up as this object rolls down the inclined plane. So speed is going up, omega should also go up. All right. What I could do Okay, what is causing rotation in the first place? In uniform motion, by the way, if I have an object that is moving with uniform speed in a circle, is the, the angular speed is constant, but is the angular velocity constant? No, because omega is changing it's direct. Omega is constant, but is the angular velocity constant? Yes. Yes. Omega is also constant. Magnitude is constant, and so is the well, and so is the direction. The direction is also constant. Okay. So there is no angular acceleration. If I define alpha as the rate of change of angular velocity which is really the derivative of the rate of change of angle which I can also write in calculus as d squared theta by d d squared. Since this is constant for uniform motion, alpha is also constant. However, for this case, since omega changes with time, it's non-uniform angular motion, therefore, there has to be an acceleration in the angular sense. Now, from linear motion, <coughs> from linear motion, we do know that F equals MA. That's the second law. Now the analog to this linear equation of motion, there is an equivalent in the rotational space. The angular acceleration, which is nothing but d square x by dt square, is replaced by the double derivative of an angular displacement which is called alpha, the angular acceleration. And corresponding to this law, you can replace A with alpha. And 
instead of m, you have a moment of inertia, and then you have a torque. Now, if you look at this example over here, let me redraw the inclined plane. I would like to look at its angular motion. What is causing its angular motion and what is causing the angular acceleration as this object slides down? If there is angular acceleration, there has to be a torque. And in the next lecture, you will learn about gyroscopes and torques. You will get exposed to torques uh, in a more elaborate fashion. But since there is angular acceleration, there has to be a torque. Now, a torque, we would like to define what is the torque here. The torque is a vector. Since this is a vector, this is also a vector. And a torque is identified by a force. And where is the force acting? In this particular case, we would like to find out where is the force acting that is causing this object to accelerate in the angular sense. Okay. Now, out, there are three forces in the in the in the parable here. Three forces are in the picture. One is the weight that is acting downwards. One is the friction. And the third one is, is the normal force. Now the weight is acting on the center of mass of this object. Okay, I'm going to redraw this. I always like to have clearer diagrams. What do you mean by what? The origin of the normal force. Why do we have it or the origin of the normal force? We have the normal force because we would like to keep the acceleration in this direction normal to the plane zero. So we already have this downward pointing force which is a component of the weight. So we must have something that balances this. So that is why we have the normal force. Now, who gives us the normal force? What is the agency here that provides the normal force? The agency is of electrostatic origin. It's Now these are atoms here, and there are atoms here, and there are interactions between these atoms which are of electrostatic nature. Sometimes they are called van der Waals forces. Those forces create that force. Okay. So when we learn about mechanics in the textbook, mechanics is macroscopic. It does not delve into the details of what is the atomistic origin of, of these uh, reactive forces, neither of friction. So from a macroscopic standpoint, this contact force, as the name implies, is there because there is contact, intimate contact between this cylinder and the inclined plane at this particular point. All right, so there is friction, there is the normal force, and I've deliberately not drawn the uh, weight, but of course there's the weight as well. Now, where does the weight act? The weight acts on the entire body. Each point has, so you can decompose this body into smaller and smaller sections. Each section will have a weight. So there is going to be a weight vector associated with each section of this body. So you can draw multiple weight vectors. Now since these are all pointing downwards, you can add up these vectors and give one big vector. Now where that big vector where will that big vector act? That big vector is going to act in the downward direction and 
from the standpoint point of viewing this object as one macroscopic whole, you can you can pose it or you can explain that this vector is acting at the center of mass of this object, mg. <coughs> now we would like to find out the torque. In order to look at the torque, you need two objects. You need to find out how much is the force that is creating the rotation, that is creating the angular acceleration, and where is that force acting? How far is it from the axis of rotation? Now there are three forces here. Does the force of friction result in a torque? Why not? Because it's not inside the body. Okay, what's a better explanation? There is no movement arm because this force is actually passing through the axis of rotation. So there's no movement arm. If you look at the contact force or the reactive force here. This reactive force also passes through the axis of rotation. This is our axis of rotation. And the axis of rotation is pointing outwards. Because this object as a whole is showing angular velocity in this direction. So this is the axis of rotation and it's pointing outwards. So this is the axis of rotation here. So the friction does not result in rotation. It does not result in rolling even though it ensures rolling, pure rolling motion, it does not result in motion. So this is like contradiction in terms. This friction is necessary to have pure rolling motion so that this point of contact is static. However, this force alone does not result in any angular acceleration. It does not create any torque whatsoever. This normal force, likewise, does not create any rotation. It does not change the angular velocity. Now, what remains is simply the weight. Now, this weight we've already decomposed into two factors. One of these factors, fortuitously or luckily, passes through this axis of rotation, mg cosine theta. And that's why it's nice to resolve this force in this fashion, one component normal to the plane and one component parallel to the plane. So this angle is theta, this angle would also be theta and this component is going to be mg sine theta. Right? And as a result, there is going to be an acceleration in a la lateral acceleration in this direction. That lateral acceleration is going to be mg sine theta minus f over m. Okay? But the key point is, okay, this is the force that can that has the potentiality of creating a torque because it does not pass through the axis of rotation, it is displaced from the axis of rotation. So can we calculate the torque due to this force? Yes, of course, we just need to find out the component of the force, mg sine theta and multiply it with the moment arm how far is the line of action of this force from the axis of rotation, which is R. This is going to be the torque. The torque is I. Now what is this I? All right, so the moment of inertia generally mr squared but we have to be careful about what r do we choose this is the moment of inertia about this axis of rotation 
All right. So we really have to find out the moment of inertia about this point. We know what the moment of inertia about the center of a disk is. So we need to find out the moment of inertia about this peripheral point by using a theorem which is called the parallel axis theorem. But I'm not going to go into that detail at the moment. So this equation will tell us how this object is going to change. How this object is going to change its motion, how this object will show us uh, different dynamics, different kinematics. By the way, something really interesting here. If I look at this expression here, d squared theta over dt squared, which is isn't this equal to alpha? Equals mg sine theta over r over i. Now this is i about this point q. The moment of inertia about this point q. Okay. Now we have some very interesting analogies between linear and circular motion. We have this S equals R theta. Something you learned in the first class. Differentiate both sides, you get V equals R omega. Correct? Then you differentiate both sides again. You have omega, uh, sorry, small a equals R alpha. So this alpha, this a, we can get a from alpha, we just multiply alpha with r. We get a equals mg r square sine theta or i cube. Okay? And now if I have a solid cylinder and I have a ring, both of these objects have different moments of inertia. If the radius here is r, the mass is m, the moment of inertia of this object about this point, about the center is going to be mr squared. The moment of inertia of this solid disk about the same point is going to be half mr squared. This moment of inertia is larger. Why is it larger? Because most of the mass is further away from the axis of rotation. Whereas this object has its mass distributed throughout the object. So the moment of inertia is smaller. Here all, the entire mass of this disk is populated in a small ring that is far away from the center. So this moment of inertia is larger. Now I actually need the moment of inertia about this point and the moment of inertia about this point. So the theorem that actually lets me calculate the moment of inertia about this point from this moment of inertia. And for that what we need to do is for this hollow cylinder IQ is Simply this moment of inertia, mr squared, plus the mass of this object and the square of this distance. It's 2 mr squared. And for this hollow, uh, this solid disk, sorry, this was the, ho this was the hollow disk. And this is the solid disk. For this disk, the moment of inertia about this peripheral point is going to be half mr squared plus mr squared, which is 3 by 2 mr squared. Now, if I insert these moments of inertia into the linear acceleration, 
mg r squared sin theta over let's do it first for the solid disk for the solid disk this turns out to be 3 over 2 m r squared okay cancel out the m's yes <clears throat> this is you can look up a catalog but really you divide this disk into small circles find the mass of each circle and then you integrate or sum up over the entire disk. This is what you would get. So for the solid disk, this n goes away, this r goes away and you are left with a nice simple juicy formula 2 over 3 g sin theta. So the so g is just the acceleration due to free fall and this downward acceleration, linear acceleration is some component, some factor of g and this acceleration does not depend upon the mass of the object and neither does it depend upon the size of the object. Okay, so it's totally which actually tells us that you can use a bigger object, smaller object, if it's solid and it's uniform, homogeneous, the linear acceleration of this object is not going to change. It only depends upon the angle of inclination of this plane. And for a hollow cylinder, a disc, the angular acceleration is mg r square sin theta divided by this i q 2 m r squared the m cancels out, the r squared cancels out and I am left with half g sin theta. Once again, this is independent of the size of the ring, provided the ring is actually a ring, all of its mass is on the periphery and it is independent of the mass of the ring. And these accelerations are different, this is smaller than this acceleration for the same angle theta. Now how do we, now we get all this theory done, we, we do all the theory, we look at a problem, an example on the blackboard, now we actually would like to observe this quantitatively in a real experiment. Of course students can have an inclined plane, they can roll down objects and use a stopwatch, but that's not going to give you the angular acceleration, the angular acceleration, the linear acceleration. You need more precise sensors to do that and the camera is is a remarkable sensor in that respect because all of us own a camera. Almost all of us own a camera. It's ubiquitous. Everyone has one. Uh, you can ask your friend who has a better camera. Your students can ask their friends who have better cameras to take videos for you and then you can do the analysis on your own. So let me give you an example of how such an analysis could be done on an inclined plane. Right. So here is another video, uh, it's which we've acquired beforehand. All right. So this is this our object rolling down. All right. Now we would like to observe it. So what we do, we open up our software as usual. Alright, so I clear all the variables, I want to start off with a fresh slate. Alright, now I would like to analyze rotational friction, this is the name of the code, okay. Then I tell my software, where is my video? 
my video is in a particular folder, rolling cylinder. Now this is my video, 240 frames per second once again. This is my video. I would like to crop my video, which means I'm not interested in the regions that are outside uh, outside a certain region. I don't want region. I don't want this region to interfere with my analysis. So I just remove the cropping, reset crop region. Okay, I just focus on a particular area. I just need to find my laser pointer. Now I would like to view my video, where would I like to start my analysis? I would like to start my analysis when my hand has dispatched this cylinder here. So I mark this as my in frame. And I would like it to run to a certain point, probably here. And mark this as my out frame. Okay, I have 240 frames in total. I close this. Now I would like to find out which objects do I, would, would I like to track. I would like to track these two objects that have been painted on the disc. And I would like to track the entire ring in its entirety as well. So I manually mark my objects exactly in the same fashion. First object. Second object, close. Now this software is creating the trajectory. See this cluster of green points here, this cluster of red points here. Most of these points are glued to my object of interest. Some of them are wavering off, so I would like to filter them out. The software actually looks at the centroid of this cluster of points, okay? I would, yes, I would like to filter some wrong track points. So I go here, here are some points that are trying to wander away, so I just remove those points. Okay, and I'm fine. I close this. I would like to define reference frames. Now, I could define different kinds of reference frames. First of all is the lab frame. So I put in a lab frame here. My x-axis I put here. This is my direction of increasing x. Y automatically adjust. This is my x-axis and this is my y-axis. Okay, I've defined this frame, but I can define any frame that I like. I could also define a frame that is slanting, so the x-axis could be along this inclined plane. And I could always move between different frames of reference. And the software allows you to do that. So I close this window. Now it's asking me for a slanting frame of reference. And then I could look at trajectories and velocities in whatever frame of reference that I choose. Uh, now I choose another frame of reference and I could toggle between frames of reference. So I put an origin here. Then I define my x axis to be along the slant of the inclined plane. This is what I get, a new x axis, which is along the slant of the inclined plane. And I can compute the trajectories in either reference frame and I can transform between different reference frames. The y axis automatically adjusts itself. Those now I need to determine where is my disk because I need to find out the center of mass motion. For that I need three points. One, two, three. Now this software is automatically going to track this object in its entirety. Now I would also like to identify some point P on the surface, on the periphery of this disk, so that I can look at angles in a, in a frame of reference that is glued to the disk. 
So all of these are technical details and once you have access to a software of this kind or this particular software, you can play with these technicalities. Now what I would like to do, I would like to define a third frame of reference that is glued or stitched onto this object so that I can find out how do the angles of this object change in this particular frame of reference. So this is my new x-axis that is glued to the uh, this and I would like to change the direction so that my y is pointing upwards. So if my omega is in this direction, my angle theta is positive with time. So I can always make, uh, make these adjustments. Then I close this. I want to accept these changes, yes. And here if you, if you actually see the software in action, you can see these mark objects which are on the periphery of this disk. The center of mass of this disk is undergoing linear motion, center of mass motion. There is a torque that is instantaneously acting on this point of contact. This point of contact at a frozen instant of time is just static due to static friction. The torque due to the component of the weight makes this object go down. It increases its linear velocity, it accelerates, the angular acceleration also goes up and the uh, linear acceleration also goes up. The linear acceleration is actually constant, sorry, but the velocity goes up. Now you could analyze, you could make plots of all of these objects just with a camera and a software. And everything will come to life, it will just be in front of your eyes, in front of your student's eyes. I welcome you to use this technology. So here I close this. <coughs> And I get a plethora of figures, lots of figures, which are hard to view here. My phone? Okay, now I need to move to PowerPoint. So what I have done in fact is, I've analyzed the motion of this rotating disk. I've done a blackboard calculation and then I would like to see whether my experiment corroborates this mathematical, now it's elevated to the status of intuition. Once you do the calculation, the calculation becomes your intuition. So whether our experimental results conforms to this mathematical intuition, for that you need an experiment. And you can't just observe with the naked eye. You have to use a camera or a sensor or some other kind of accelerometer or gyroscope and I'll give you an example for that too. So these are the three frames of reference. One is the blue one, the lab frame, the orange one which is also the lab frame but it's static and it's slanted with respect to the blue frame and the third is a moving frame and it's actually a non-inertial frame because the center of mass velocity is not constant. This object is accelerating downwards. So now we have an example of a non-inertial or a non-inertial translational frame, it's not, it's, it's, all, it's not rotating by the way, this red frame is not rotating, so I'm keeping this frame fixed. I can also have a frame that is actually rotating with the disk. So in all of these frames of reference, I can work out what the math is going to be, what are the different trajectories that come out from this model here. Combination of rotation and translation, and these are what the plots actually look like. So, <clears throat> And this is the cycloidal motion. Probably Professor Avdi is going to show you a slide of cycloidal motion from, from some book from the 1950s or the 1960s when this technology was not really very ubiquitous or commonly available and you need sophisticated techniques to do video analysis of this kind. But now school children can do this. So you can analyze the center of mass motion and if I look at one peripheral point, you can observe that this peripheral point as a cycloidal trajectory and you can find out the mathematical equation for this trajectory. Here you are observing the angular velocity omega as it's increasing with time because of the angular acceleration. Here is how the angle theta with which this object, a peripheral point of this object is rotating as this disk is 
rolling downwards, how that angle in theta, in radians, is increasing with time. When I wrap this angle in, in terms of two pi's, which means in terms of degrees, this is what I get. From the data of the trajectories, I can also calculate the velocities. Here is a velocity in a particular frame of reference. Here is a trajectory in another frame of reference. Here is the velocity in this particular frame of reference. The key idea is that once you have the data available, with the help of a camera, you've gathered lo large amounts of data, you can actually work wonders. You can actually do lots of interesting stuff. For example, let's look at a video over here. Now this is more uh, exciting stuff that actually you do in an undergraduate laboratory, not in a school laboratory, but still, you are bigger than your students. So, if you were excited, you'd be able to fascinate your students. So look at this video over here. This video is a boring, innocuous video, but actually these small microspheres are jostling. They are showing, if you observe carefully, they are in this jittery motion. This was an experiment that was actually done almost a hundred years ago by uh, a physicist with the name of Perrin, uh, who actually performed this experiment under a microscope, he put pollen grains inside an aqueous medium and looked at the trajectory of these pollen grains. And if I, I, I looked up his book, and this is uh, a folio from his book, and the, these are his images, painstakingly taken with manual techniques, and this is what we could do with the modern camera and a microscope, we could plot the trajectories. One of our students who's sitting here is actually, I'm taking data from his work, and then you can plot the the distance squared versus time, and from this you can gather Avogadro's constant, and you can gather Planck's constant, and so on. Now look at these two di these two videos here. One is of a disk, and with high-speed analysis, you can track the motion of this disk. The center of mass of this disk is being tracked with with the particular software that I showed you, and the trajectory of this center of mass is inward spiraling. Then you have a ring. The trajectory changes altogether. Now instead of inward motion, you have outward retrograde motion. With objects of different kinds, you can have different kinds of motion. Now all of this could be done with video analysis, and what should be the benchmark of a secondary school student? Someone, or a higher secondary school student? An FSC student. The benchmark that we should all strive for are these international physics competitions. The Physics Olympiad, or the International Young Physics Talent Competition. That should be our national benchmark of what kind of scientific literacy would we like to have in our students at the FSC level. Still have a long way to go, but Singapore has done it. A country, a developing country like Vietnam has done it, so why can't we? Now in the last example, I would like to switch gears. And I would like to actually use another device, which we are all familiar with hopefully. And this is a smartphone. So, <coughs> uh, I think I need to change it. So in the smartphone, this is just like a mobile laboratory. Instead of the camera, which of course the smartphone is also equipped with, you could also use the sensors that are built inside a smartphone. A smartphone has a number of sensors. The most common ones are an accelerometer. The accelerometer measures acceleration. So if this object is rotating, and if you have the accelerator switched on and you have a certain app that can determine, and that can gather data from the accelerometer, you can plot the acceleration with this time. You can see how the acceleration of this object as a whole is changing with time. You also have a gyroscope in this sensor. The gyroscope measures angular velocities. So you can have accelerations, you can have angular velocities, 
In fact, the sense the mobile phone uses these sensors to determine the orientation and tilt of your smartphone. And you would like to lock your screen so that it's impervious to rotation. You would like it's using data from these sensors. So these sensors are provided to you as an icing on the top when you buy a smartphone sensor, a smartphone or a mobile phone. Now I think all school laboratories should own at least one smartphone. Should be embedded. But the current state of affairs is that our school laboratories don't even they don't even like to purchase matchboxes in the chemistry laboratory. But I think if they can have IT labs, if they can have if China can have 3D printers in all schools, why can't we have a smartphone? Okay? Yes. If you're sitting inside the car and you have your sensors on, you can actually measure the acceleration, so you measure the speed. So now what we would like to do is, there's a certain app that I've downloaded on this, on this smartphone. And I would, first of all, I would like to see what is physically happening here. This smartphone is attached to a bicycle wheel, and I set this in motion. So let's see what the motion looks like. So it's circular motion. Okay, just observe this. It's circular motion going around a complete circle like the milk uh, uh, Fryats have used to buy in his childhood years. It's like whirling a bucket of milk. Okay? But this smartphone is tied to the rim of the wheel using these cable ties. And then this circular motion fades away into oscillatory motion. Okay, because it's jumping at this bearing here. First question, when this object was exhibiting circular motion, is it uniform circular motion? By observation, no, but physically, why? If there's no damping, should there be uniform circular motion? Sorry? Exactly, because there is downward gravity bias acting on it. Just like you throw this object, there is a gravity acting on this object continually in the downward direction. Okay? So, there is no uniform motion here. It's non-uniform motion. The omega is going to change. Now, we would like to gather this data. So, I turn on the sensors and the sensors will load data into a buffer. But for purposes of demonstration, I link this up with the computer. So that computer is, this smartphone is sending data which is being acquired in real time to the wireless network in this room which is being picked up by the computer over here. Okay, so that you can see the outcomes of, of the various data sets. Of the various, so we have, just a minute, we have in front of, the, in, in the screen, in the screen in front of you, you have two, Windows, is there an open hand? Zoom out. Okay. All right, so what, what we've done here is we have an IP address for which is connect, making the connection between this wireless card and this smartphone, we have a port. And these three indicators are showing the x, y, and z components of acceleration. Acceleration is a vector. So it must be defined by three coordinates, three variables, x, y, and z. And then these three uh, fields are showing the components of the angular velocity. All right. So a question before we run this, a question about that I may like to ask you is the following. This is my smartphone. It's tied to the rim of a wheel. Okay? And this is the and this is the direction of motion. 
Now the smartphone by convention defines its axis in a particular way. This is the z-axis. This is the y-axis. And this is pointing inwards is the x-axis. Okay? First question is about the angular velocity. When this object is showing rotational motion, what's the direction of the angular velocity? Will it have a component along z, along y, along x, or will this vector be in an arbitrary direction with all three components? All right, so this is the rotation. Z axis is upward. This is my Y axis. And this is my X axis pointing towards you. So it's when it shows oscillations or rotations, the angular velocity will have a component towards you. But it's a vector. It's only going to have an X component. It can have slight Y and Z components as well because of it, it might wobble. Uh, it's not a perfect circle in which it moves. And the angular acceleration. Let's talk about the acceleration. Now, it seems that this object will have an acceleration along the z direction, right? Or, or will it not? The problem with smartphone sensors is that if you just put this smartphone in this static condition, pointing upwards, its inertial sensor shows an acceleration of plus g. 